So welcome all and thanks for joining tonight's meeting of Wellbeing Economy Wales. We're the Welsh hub of the international movement that is the Wellbeing Economy Alliance. And we hold these open discussion forums online every month, bringing together people, projects and initiatives across Wales who share an interest in a range of different topics relating to how we create a well-being economy here in Wales. Tonight we're talking about our food system and how we might transform our food system, which is clearly a key component of how we build a well-being economy. A well-being economy is one that serves the well-being of people, places and planet. And I don't need to tell you that over past years and decades, our economic system and our food systems have developed in a way that is not conducive to well-being. Um, whether we're talking about the well-being of the environment and our natural ecosystems or the well-being of communities and our social ecosystems with the predominance of large corporations. I think there's some shocking statistic that most of our food brands are all owned by one or two major global corporations um, and our food is grown in a way that um, destroys ecosystems and pollutes our planet and uh, degrades our soil and long supply chains contribute to climate change and food waste is a major contributor to emissions um, and I could go on and I'm sure some of these topics will come up during the course of the discussion um, but we're also really interested in food as an enabler as an enabler of well-being in local places how do we reconnect with where our food comes from and um, growing and producing and sharing food at a local level um, and how that can help to strengthen the fabric in local places, the fabric of our communities. Um, so we've invited all of you and others from across Wales who are interested in the transformation of our food system, um, who are leading projects and initiatives or perhaps thinking about doing so at a local level. Um, and our intention this evening is to try and connect the dots, highlight some of the amazing stuff that's already happening across Wales, learn from each other, um, and perhaps collectively um, emerge the kind of key obstacles or priorities or recommendations for Welsh Government or whatever it might be, um, really giving a forum for a collective voice around what's important for food. Uh, do put yourself on mute if you don't mind doing that. That's all right, Duncan, I've muted you. <laughs> um, it's great to see so many people here and all those who've connected with us by email and on Twitter to share updates on their projects. One of the things that we're hoping to do, we've never done this before, but we're hoping to co-create a Wales-wide map of food projects and initiatives during the course of this evening's discussion, uh, which will just give us all a clearer picture and uh, a collective resource really to look into who's doing what and hopefully um, connect with similar groups and projects that we can learn from in different areas of Wales. Um, I'm going to share a link in the chat now at the beginning of the meeting, but we will come back to this later. But some of you who are sort of particularly technically whizzy and familiar with Google Maps will have no problem in starting to add your markers onto this, this collaborative Wales wide foodie map that we're creating. Um, so if you're comfortable, go ahead and do that. If we've got time later on, I'll give a bit of a tutorial, um, share my screen and show you how to add a marker. So no panic about that. The format of this evening's discussion will, will be, uh, first of all, my colleague Duncan, who was really instrumental in establishing the Wellbeing Economy Alliance here in Wales, um, and who is also really involved in a fantastic food initiative. Um, he will give us a bit of an intro and context setting and talk about what he's up to. And then we're going to have a kind of open mic session. So I'm hoping that those of you who have joined us from across Wales will be willing to put your hands up and share your own updates about your own local food projects. And the format of that might be that you think about sharing an update on what you're up to, um, sharing any learnings or advice from your own journey, and perhaps any asks 
um, of the community or of the Welsh government or whoever else the kind of key um, holders are of, of possibility. So updates, advice and asks um, would be the format of your updates if you want to start thinking about those. But before we do that, it's my real pleasure to welcome Duncan Fisher to the meeting. And as I say, Duncan has been really, really involved in the Wellbeing Economy Alliance over the last two years. And I know really is busy launching an exciting initiative where he is. So Duncan, if you're ready to take over, um, you can unmute yourself and um, talk okay. to us about what you've been up to. And I can share a screen, can I? I believe you can. Yeah, no, yeah. host disabled participant screen sharing. If you try it now, you will be able to. Magic. Sorry about this, folks. I recently updated my system and it keeps throwing things that I've never seen before. No. Um, and I don't know what it's doing. Um, I don't think I can share my screen because it's turned it off. Um, do you want to email it to me or Dawn and we can share it for you? Yeah, that, that might be. Sorry about this, folks. I just, it's never happened before. <laughs> no, it's always the same, isn't it? There's always something, don't worry. Um, yeah, here it is. Yeah. Hey, okay, it's working. That well, worked, sorry about that. Yeah. There are my, in the middle of a meeting setting up my laptop. No worries. Um, slideshow. Mm. Right, does that work, folks? That looks great, Duncan. Yep, okay, okay sorry it. about that. I've just, yeah, I so say I updated the operating system and um, it throws me these surprises all the time and um, things that have never happened before. Okay, so uh, I, what I'm going to do is present what we're doing in the Brecon Beacons and Monmouthshire um, and also as I'll, I'll also say what we're not doing because we're not doing everything here and I think that's important um, we're not this is not a panacea um, there is lots of other stuff that other people need to do and we are working with others in our region um, but I'll start with what we're doing so our project covers Monmouthshire, the Brecon Beacons uh, in South East Wales, and like every other, the challenges we face are the same as every other rural area in Wales. Um, we used to have, before the war, before the Second World War, a thriving local food economy, mixed farming, lots of buying and selling locally. And since then, because of the common agricultural policy, that has been completely dismantled in its entirety. And now almost all the food that is grown here is exported out. And almost all the food that we eat here, we buy in supermarkets. There's very little trade going on within the region. Um, the results, one of the results of that is that farmers are very poorly paid because the power is with the intermediaries, it's with the supermarkets, and they can push down prices. Um, and so farmers are dependent on farm subsidies uh, and at the moment, a lot of them are being pushed right out of business, even with subsidies. Um, so they get a very bad price for their product. Um, the other challenge we have, which is the same for the whole of Wales, but particularly in national park areas, is house and land prices are skyrocketing at the moment. We have corporates who want to buy farmland to rewild. We have second homeowners wanting to invest in holiday cottages. We have cities full of people who suddenly discover that they can live in a beautiful place and continue to work in the city, like Birmingham, for example. And then we have lots of wealthy people from London retiring and buying out the property. So housing is basically completely beyond um, 
uh, well, no young person. I mean, I've raised my children here. They've got no chance of living here. Um, there's a culture of buying in supermarkets. So um, everyone just rushes off to the supermarket uh, and that's the way we, we operate. Um, we have a fragile, we've, we're beginning to see this more and more post Brexit and also uh, uh, during the lockdown that the, the food system is not stable at all. Actually, it's very, very fragile and things are starting to go wrong with it, particularly at the moment with with the war in Ukraine and things like that. Then we have the climate change and the fact that 25% of the global emissions comes from the food sector as, as it's currently structured. There's a health crisis um, and and then there's the myth of what I, we call the myth of cheap food. That's the idea that we deserve or we that food must be cheap and, and because people are poor therefore food must be cheap um, but food isn't cheap uh, what food is if it's cheap it's because this because someone is not paying the full price and it's the supermarkets and um, the problem is not that the food is too expensive but it's that people are too poor to have food <laughs> so it's a whole other issue um, that there should be people not have enough even to eat. Um, so we, what we want to do here is rebuild a whole new food economy. And that's actually extraordinarily difficult because everything is broken at the same time. And if you fix one little bit of it, it makes absolutely no difference because it can't work because all the other bits are broken. Um, and so it becomes a really vast undertaking. Um, and we've, so we've tried to work out a strategy for how we deal with that. Um, and, and so these are the elements of what we're doing. So the, first of all, we decided that we would focus on vegetables because people buy them every week. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a basic necessity. And it, it's, it creates a market that happens every week, unlike any other kind of food, which you may have one week, but not the other. This is like rolling all the time. And that's a foundation. You can build on top of that the sale of other local products, but there has to be that. So we decided we would focus on that, not because we just think that's important, but because we think that's the best place to start. Uh, we need to acquire land. There just isn't there's very little production of local food and we need to it needs to grow somewhere and the farmers not motive you know there's there's no big change in the way farming is happening we need to find land um, somewhere we also have to find new farmers this kind of farming um, horticulture the sort of commercial horticulture using regenerative and some of the most modern techniques that have been developed in United States and in Sweden and Canada, they, it employs about one person per acre. Now, I mean, that is just so hugely more than uh, tr a traditional farm might have one farmhouse and 70 acres, you know, one, two people per 70 acres. So we have to find an awful lot of farmers and they don't just come overnight. Um, we then have to rebuild the local supply chains. P people are not selling and buying from each other here. Um, housing is has arisen far more quickly than we thought. Like the very first farm we're working with, housing is a problem. There is no housing. It's, there's no housing at all that's available to anyone except the wealthy. But also, even if there were, it's not near the fields because all the housing has been taken away from the fields and all the planning permission doesn't like that happening. So we've got to deal with that, that's a big problem. Uh, business startup funding, the, the Welsh government supports farms that are bigger than five hectares, which is about 12 acres, because they think that anything less than that isn't a proper farm, presumably because it's not supplying the supermarkets, it's just too small. All of these farms are less than five hectares. That's the whole point of this type of farming, is that it's, it's human-sized. Two people can't 
unless they mechanize, they can't work more than a few acres without walking their feet off during the day. It's a simple sort of physical uh, limit. So there's no funding, there's no startup funding. So we have to, we have to create our own um, startup funding mechanisms because we can't wait for government and government's gonna take forever. Um, we have to rebuild local demand. We've got to make people think that local food is not expensive, it's not niche, it's, it's, it's available for everybody. That's a big change of culture. And then all the policy and planning rules are all wrong. All of them are wrong. And it's a terrible when we, because we, we're actually developing farms. And it's terrible, it's a terrible mess, a terrible mess. And, and people, new farmers suffer a lot actually because of the humiliation and torture of the planning system. Um, so nothing is right, nothing adds up, nothing works, everything's broken and every time you try to do anything you're defeated by so many things. So it's, it's a big challenge. There is good news. First and foremost, um, if you grow food here, it flies out. You can't, everyone who's growing stuff here is selling everything. With hardly any marketing at the moment, um, because people want more, you know, there's demand that strips supply by quite a big margin. The other thing is that the modern small farm regenerative horticulture that, that, that's been, the, the models and the methods that have been developed are profitable. The methods focus on uh, productivity margin. They, they focus on improving productivity by a, a, a million tiny ways so that you're always, always getting more and more efficient. And that pushes it into profitability without even subsidies. Um, if they, you know, they don't get subsidies because they're too small, <laughs> um, but they, they can wash their own faces, which is remarkable actually in the agricultural sector. Um, also regenerative horticulture improves, builds the soil. It, it maximizes um, the amount of carbon in the soil. So for example, you don't ever pull anything out of the soil. You, you cut things down when you harvest them and you let everything rot in the soil. Um, and you're continually pushing stuff into the soil. Um, and that fixes carbon and a lot of carbon. It reduces flooding astonishingly. The, the absorbency of the soil skyrockets when the carbon content goes up. Um, and it also is uh, much more drought resistant because it holds the water during drought as well. And then of course it cuts food miles, so you cut out all the lorries trundling up and down the motorways and aeroplanes. Um, fresh seasonal produce, it's, it's high in nutrients. If you grow food in healthy soil, there's more nutrient in the food um, and that's good for health. And Finally, it does require a small amount of land. We're, we're, we're talking three to five acres, sort of you know, small bits. It's not, it's not the, that's not difficult. If we needed 50 acres, it would be a much bigger problem, but we, we don't. So what we did, and, and really I'm not gonna say much more than this. So we thought we have to build the institution that can make this happen and we spent quite a long time on this and finally came up with a, a community benefit society model. We, we organized a series of discussion meetings like this one, um, the secret purpose of which was to see who came and see who would be the best supporters. And so we found a board of directors through those meetings, um, none of whom we knew at the beginning. So we have a locally managed thing. And the, the, what a community benefit society does is it can buy land for the community. It can issue community shares and then buy land. And that's why we wanted that body. We're not buying land at the moment. That's not the first step. So we, we spent a long time setting that up and making it a very credible body uh, with very established directors, a lot of emphasis on credibility and reliability and you know no, it's not a song and dance we've got to earn the trust 
of cynical landowners, basically, and you don't do that by flamboyance. So we work quite hard on that. We're still working on that. And that's the engine. Then we set ourselves the target of 1,200 acres. Um, why 1,200? Because it's a nice number. <laughs> uh, it looks nice. But also, theoretically, um, this kind of farming, um, a football pitch worth of this kind of farming um, feeds about 60 families throughout the year. So 1,200 acres would feed everybody in Monmouthshire and the Brecon Beacons. Um, so it won't be like that because obviously, but the point is it's big enough to transform the local food economy. There'd be so much buying and selling that all the other farms producing eggs and meat and could say, oh, I'll, I'll join in. And that's what we want them to do. So eventually we'd like to say, to present to farmers an alternative to the supermarkets. It won't be for some years because we've got to build this a long time, but that's where we want to get to. It's already happened in Crick Howell, actually where I live in that uh, an organic dairy is being forced out of business um, by the um, downward pressure on prices from the, the global system. Um, and so it turned to the farm that we helped build, the Langtons farm that's next door, um, to reach their customer base in order to sell organic milk. And of course, the customer base was incredibly enthusiastic about that. Everyone wants it. And so they were, they are now changing their entire business model towards local production because there is some minuscule bit of local food economy in our town. It doesn't take a lot. And so we hopefully are going to save that farm. Um, anyway, so we, we set ourselves to find that land. Um, we're starting by finding land to lease. So we, we launched a call to action um, to landowners. We got, on, we got some of the, the, the rural land agents on board, the really tweed jacket brigade, really sort of, you know, and we got them to speak and that really gave that and talked about tax and inheritance and boring things like that, which really helped us. Um, and we got 21 offers of land. Um, and we are working through them. Some of them are not any good. Some of them are so good, it's unbelievable. Um, but we reckon we'll end up with about 10 in the first round. And we are just about literally tomorrow starting to promote profiles of that land to land seekers. And land seekers are local, there's a local course in hort regenerative horticulture at the Black Mountains College. But we're also promoting it through the Soil Association across the whole of the UK, because everywhere in the UK, there are people looking for land but can't find it. And we want them to come here. We don't know if that's gonna work, but we never know what's, if anything's gonna work. We just try it and pray. Um, and so far, so good, but we'll see. We are starting to prepare to buy land. So we, uh, uh, someone contacted us recently and said, well, I will buy land as a cash buyer, because if you want to buy land, you have to be ready to buy it at a sort of 24 hour notice because of the, the way it goes. And they said, well, they'll buy it and then we can buy it back off them, but we can have six months to do it. And that enables us to organize the community to buy the land without, you know, without competing with corporates that want to buy it immediately. And then, of course, encouraging existing farmers to change their farming and, and put some, or some of this farming on their farm. So that we don't really care how 1,200 acres comes about. Uh, we just want it to come about. Um, so we're finding that we're setting up we're, the, the, the farmers that we do have are now getting together. They're all small. They need to collaborate in order to survive the marketplace. And they will work together. They are working together on jointly expanding the market. So reaching into Cardiff, for example, will be one of their projects. Um, supporting new entrants, offering work experience, having school visits, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then economies of scale, they'll share. There's discussion about sharing the electric delivery vehicle, for example. Uh, between several businesses, that kind of thing. Economies of scale through size. 
Um, we'll support the new farms. We, we are doing that. Um, so one farm, we they were so upset about planning that we got the chief executive of the National Park and the head of planning to go and visit their farm and sit in the field and just hear what it's like to battle with planning permission regulations which are not designed for anything like this. But the National Park is really on board with this, as is Monmouthshire County Council. So it's their problem and they know it and they've got to fix it. But, but the farmers, you know, they're tearing their hair out. Um, and we need to help them. And similarly with the access to finance and housing and all the other problems that they will face. And then we have to build local demand for food. That's a combination of direct, you know, helping joint marketing, but it's also education. It's also about talking to children. It's quite clever to talk to children because they then go home to their parents and say, we need to buy local food. It's quite good technique, especially primary school children. Um, so there's that kind of aspect. And then, as I said before, working with Monmouthshire County Council and the National Park Authority to sort, sort out their systems. And we're doing all of those things um, and we're just following our noses really and seeing what we need, you know, we're adapting as we go along. The housing, for example, we thought, well, let's start that next year, but it's hit us right in the face. We've got to deal with it pretty much now. Um, and we look at what we are actually looking at is removable zero carbon housing units that can be driven in on the lorry, bolted together, and then they can be taken away again at the end of the lease, that kind of thing. We're looking quite innovatively. And that, th this is just a picture of the farms that have popped up actually in the last few years around Abergavenny, which is in the middle of our region. It's just a, an indication that I don't, I think about two of three of those farms were there before and they, they've all popped up in the last few years. So something's happening, uh, it, it's starting to work. Um, and, uh, but it's still terribly niche at the moment um, and it's not yet mainstream. But that's it, thank you. Thank you, Duncan. Amazing. What an inspiring project and uh, great to kick off the meeting um, with that overview of the big issues and challenges that I'm sure resonate with people in the group this evening. Um, I'd welcome anyone who wants to put their hands up at this point and reflect on anything that Duncan has shared. John Hallam, that was quick off the mark. Uh, would you like to come in and share any reflections on what we've heard so far? Oh, sorry, you need to, I think I unmuted you at the same time as you did. There we go. Can you try again to unmute? There we go. There we are. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, great. Yeah, hi, I'm John from Main D Unlimited in Newport. Um, so interesting presentation, Duncan. Um, we are, our organisation is very urban. We're in the middle of the most densely populated part of Newport um, with very little open green space. The least amount of green space in the whole and any ward in Newport, and we're in, we're in the city. So our our environment contrasts quite dramatically with the environment you showed in your map. Um, but I think it'd be interesting to work out how, um, from from a rural Monmouthshire perspective, and you mentioned about the working into cities, how you might begin to build relationships with the, um, the urban communities in Wales. Um, so I think there's a danger if you don't, you become a bit of a sort of country hobby sort of thing, you know, it's all rural. But of course the populations are mainly in the cities and the, and the, and the challenge is principally in terms of people's behaviour, is principally people's you know, consuming behaviour in the cities. So just wonder if you've got any, any, any thoughts on that? I'll take a few comments and then we can come back to Duncan. Would anyone else like to uh, share any thoughts? Uh, Valerie, yes, are you able to unmute? No, we can't hear you yet, I'm afraid, Valerie, you need to unmute. There. I was there waiting for you to unmute me so that we didn't do it together again. Um, I think that this is a lovely idea, and I like the idea of bringing the, the countryside into the towns, as the last speaker was saying. Um, 
there's a lot of things been popping up during the COVID. Uh, little local pop-up shops have happened and that kind of thing could help. And I also wondered about mobile vans. We used to have a mobile van that came round here, uh, even as into Little Mothervai, which is also in the Brecon Beacons, but the opposite end to you, Duncan. <laughs> and, um, you know, it, it, it stopped because um, petrol prices and so on were going up. But if we can show a scale of economy that buying local actually brings money into the local community, um, and I love this idea of involve, involving the children too. I do no dig gardening and nearly all my neighbors look over the fence and uh, over my head and say, gosh, your things are coming on faster than mine. Mm, that happens. Just thoughts. <laughs> Thank you, oh, Valerie. And Duncan, I'd love that map so that I can go and visit some of those farms, especially if they've got stalls or selling at the gate. Mm. Great, thank you. One more question or comment for Duncan and then we'll come back to you for a minute, Duncan. Anyone else like to reflect on what Duncan has shared? Yes, Alex. Hello, yeah, I just wanted to commend Duncan and the team. I've been following the 1200 project for a few months, if not longer. And I think it's it truly is inspirational. And I know that across West Wales in particular, there's lots of different projects happening which is fantastic but yeah i just wanted to say well done and and thank you okay. for our future generations so duncan do you want to come back on that question about the the sort of rural versus the urban and how we yeah can, yeah absolutely um, well I, john i'm really glad you spoke because i'm going to contact you after this um because we were talking i was talking with mom yesterday about newport um and so uh, that's it, problem solved. I came to a we all meeting and no, the, there are two things that we, we're interested in. One is, yeah, yes, we, serving our own local communities for an, a rural area is only the first step. The next step is we've got to serve the cities and that's the same for every rural area. Um, and we need to connect with that and for, for, for the neighbouring cities, what we, we can't do that at the moment because there just isn't enough food produced here at all, not even remotely. Um, so we have to wait till we're a bit bigger before we start. But when we do supply, it, we need to have a sort of, it needs to be organised. You know, we've got to, the farms have got to collaborate because they can't all go piling into Newport. We, we have to have a sort of Newport shop or a Newport delivery system or something. The other thing that we are, and this is the thing that I was talking to Momish County Council about, is how does this whole thing, what we're doing, fit in with the food poverty issue and the people who can't afford food? And it's a really difficult one. <laughs> um, and I said to Momish County Council, look, you ought to um, host an, what, we, what they, they actually called an ideas lab where we, we come up with, well, what's a, how do we make, how do we connect local food production to enabling people who can't afford food to have it without being a charity? No. And the, there's been some, there, there was a, there's a guy called Chris Blake, who I'm sure a lot of you know, and he wrote, if you look it up, he, look, he wrote two articles for the Institute of Welsh Affairs saying, well, we managed to make renewable energy, which was very expensive to begin with, affordable through economic um, instruments. Could those same methods be applied to the food system so that we're making this kind of sustainable food over time um, competitively priced with supermarkets? It's difficult with supermarkets because they cheat, they externalize so much of the cost. But I, I, we're determined to do something. Now, all the regenerative farms that we're working with already support the local food banks in different ways on their own initiative. So one of them 
has a Robin Hood scheme, it calls it, where anyone who can pay more for a box is invited to pay more, which enables them to supply boxes to the food bank every week. Um, the other, another farm, if they can't sell all their product at the end of market day, it all goes like, like the supermarket, some supermarkets do. But these are tiny little initiatives. We, we've got to fix the problem. And I, and I think that we should get, and, and my thought was with Monica, that we should get together with Newport on this one uh, and try and work something out, but it's going to be extremely difficult, but I think we should do it. Actually, we have to do it. Um, and it's going to create, it's going to be a lot of creativity and thought um, about how you do it sustainably. So it's not just you know, charity, it's got to work. Um, and I don't know how that's going to happen, but it must do. So um, thank you, John. <laughs> OK, well, I look forward to your, um, yeah, your email, should, Duncan. Yeah, we should talk. I think I think we I mean, we won't take up the meeting's time, but I think we, we would have a lot to talk about. And I yeah. think it could be interesting if, if you were able to pop down to Newport and yeah. we could show you around what we're doing here on the urban front. And I think that synergy between the rural and the urban is something we could definitely take forward with you. Great. Thank you, John. Thanks, Duncan. Um, it's an open mic tonight, so I'm really, really keen now for people to start putting their hands up to tell us all about what you're up to locally or food initiatives that you're aware of or inspired by. Um, this evening's event was really billed as an opportunity for us to share updates from across Wales and hear from projects and initiatives that we may not already be connected with. Um, I know some of you are posting links already in the chat, but I'm looking for raised hands. And Margot, I saw you waving at me, so would you like to come in? Um, I'm not speaking for myself, really, but I put in the chat at the very beginning a message from Elizabeth Hudson of Compass, who cannot be here tonight. And she asked me to let people know that they already have a network for social businesses in the food sector that meet together every three months. And I have put her contact email in, in the chat there. When I saw this, I, I was um, taken to a current issue in Swansea where one of the local community cafes run by the Leonard Cheshire Foundation is going to have to close after two years um, because of the COVID issues and the others. Um, even though it gives uh, work to uh, disabled people and it has a, an IT cafe adjacent to it uh, for meetings, and it uses uh, quite a bit of local food. And I wondered whether this um, mechanism that Elizabeth talked about, the network for social businesses in the food sector would work. Has anybody participated in that? Okay. Thank you, Margot. Um, great to hear about that <laughs> network. So it's Compass. Compass is the new name, isn't it, for the Wales Cooperative Centre, I think. So uh, they've got a network for social enterprises in Wales. Um, right, let's hear from some of you. Alex, I'm going to call on you from Superbox. Tell us about Superbox in the absence of uh, waving hands. You can go first. <laughs> Thanks very <laughs> much. Um, uh, yeah, Superbox, um, Wales' own recipe box service, similar to other national competitors. We've just launched nationwide delivery, so thanks for thanks for giving me the opportunity. Um, we source seasonal, organic, sustainable, and regenerative Welsh ingredients, and from a network of small scale suppliers, and we deliver them um, across Wales now. And we reinvest profits into community food education, Wales's first community freezer. Um, and different projects like that. And yeah, excitably also we in Carmarthenshire with the latest sustainable food place in Wales. So we've just joined that programme. So we're bringing together stakeholders um, from the public sector um, and Carmarthenshire's food network, 
all around the table to discuss different working strategies and action plans to increase the amount of local food on the public plate alongside health and well-being um, and all the other issues that Duncan so eloquently mentioned. Thank you, Dawn. Um, Alex, share a little bit about the, the challenges as a social enterprise um, or as a business, really, trying to make it work using locally sourced and sustainably produced food. Uh, what are some of the challenges or learnings that you would like to share? The challenges for us a lot over the, the sort of the past year, the journey um, is dealing with with growers. Um, and understanding and trying to give local growers the confidence to what well, sorry what we what we find with my previous business is that local growers are really keen to grow for you but as a startup business it's really hard to ensure that you can buy the supply off them um, as a as a sort of a fledgling business uh, so that's been a challenge. Another challenge is reaching customers, um, but also bringing customers along the journey to understand why regenerative agriculture is important, but also why paying our suppliers a fair price is also important as well. Great. I'm sure we'll come back to that discussion about educating people on why they should perhaps spend more on food that's produced in a certain way. But thank you for being the first to share there, Alex. Appreciated. Who else will tell us about um, your projects, initiatives or local groups? Nicola. Yes, we'd love to hear from you. Hi guys, I'm Nicola. Um, I'm based in Caradigion, um, in a little rural village, Aberporth. Um, it was a, we launched our first community fridge in October. So obviously, I don't know if you know about com community fridges, but it's about um, combating surplus food ending up in landfill. So we collect food from supermarkets, households and gardens. We've also launched a community garden. Um, I host various visits from schools. Um, they come over and they um, we share food with them. I'm launching a lunch club tomorrow, offering pay as you feel lunches. And we also run a community clothing exchange to prevent surplus clothing ending in landfill, um, as well as a toy library, which is nearly established. I'm almost there. Um, Digi club and free Wi-Fi in the centre as well. So, yeah, busy. That sounds really busy. So we've seen community fridges, I think, popping up across Wales. Um, and it's one way of making sure surplus food uh, reaches people who could benefit from it. Um, any learnings or advice that you would share with other communities seeking to do something similar? Um, it's, it's been really good. We've got a really great cohort of volunteers. I've got about 56 volunteers on my books, about 25 active. So the project's going really well. Um, the barriers, I think, is just breaking down the um, stigma, people thinking it's a food bank. Um, but by being about sustainability rather than hitting the poverty aspect, we are seeing a lot of people in need who would usually be quite proud and would suffer in silence coming to use us. So um, just keep an open mind, really, as to the kind of clients you'll get coming in. Um, I've also had the Housing Association asking me to do food parcels, social services asking us to deliver food parcels. So we are going to have to look at maybe launching a food bank on one day a week, because obviously with um, the collections, we don't know what kind of donations we're going to get in. Um, but yeah, the need is just growing crazy, really. Yeah, well, that's uh, really useful insight thanks Nicola for sharing and um, yeah the demand and the and the requests for support um, growing across Wales with a sort of cost of living crisis that we're all aware of. Um, Alison was that a hand up or a round of applause? Yeah I put a, yes. I put a thumbs up by mistake. Oh. <laughs> yes, let's hear from you. <laughs> it was really good to hear that that last person whose name I've forgotten. Um, Nicola. Hi Nicola. Um, Hi. Yeah, um, Alex's comment. We do. We actually have a freezer as well. So yeah, we try and we try and completely reduce it. And anything that we also have surplus, we um, ship to the community garden. 
uh, um, that we can feed the birds, we put in the compost. And we also have links with a piggery who take a lot of stuff as well. So we're virtually zero waste. That's amazing. Amazing. Great. Thank you for that. Um, Alison, what were you going to tell us about? Um, I'm involved in a few community pantries um, through work at Link Cymru, which is a housing association that covers most of South Wales. Um, we support the running of 13 community pantries throughout Bridge End. Um, and they're run by a CIC called Beobab Bach um, that's, that support all the pantries. So I, I, I put my hand up just then because um, Nikki was talking about you know, doing deliveries and Bridge End is an area where um, there's a lot of, you know, quite isolated communities where it's hard to get to, you know, without traveling some distance. So, as well as having people coming into the community pantries, we do do deliveries. Um, it's a system that works with Fair Share as a partner. So people pay five pounds for, for a bag of food and get about 20 pounds, 25 pounds um, worth of food. And we're linking in with community growers as well. We've just started to do that. Um, but I'm also here with my colleagues, J John Hallerman and Trish Johns, who, um, who helped to run Mandy Community Pantry in, in Newport. But I won't, I won't talk about that because I'll let them talk about it if they want to. Okay, Brill, thank you, Alison. Um, Rob has been sitting there with a hand up. Let's hear from you, Rob. Oh, hi. Um, am I I'm muted? Yes, I have you. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm Rob. I'm a, a, a consultant. I work for the Broad Partnership. And um, over the last few years, I've um, found myself increasingly involved in sort of various aspects of food growing initiatives. Um, we're doing the evaluation of big box buoyed, uh, which is being rolled out across South Wales. Some people have heard about that. Started in Crickowl and Barry. It's very much a sort of a, a school orientated uh, approach to it. We're also involved with um, the evaluation of Tavi Dovey. I see there's somebody from Eco Dovey here today. Uh, but there's a whole range of different schemes coming up. Um, and inspired by what Duncan was saying, uh, the question that went through my mind is, where is the sort of policy angles on this from the point of view of Welsh Government and NRW? There's a, there's a lot of publicly owned land out there that could be made available. Now, th there was a community food growing, growing um, uh, strategy developed by the Welsh Government about oh, 10 or 12 years ago when Ellen Jones was a minister. And if you, if you look at that, you know, historically, it's very, very interesting. But what's happened to it? And if ever there was a need for that kind of policy initiative, initiative at the moment, we're at the brink of the change in uh, that will come from the sustainable farming scheme. Um, NRW are leading their sort of na nature and those national conversation. And the number of times local food growing has come up in those conversations is, is quite astonishing. So there seems to be a groundswell of ideas on this. Um, and the, the sort of point I wanted to raise was how is it possible to sort of galvanize a lot of that energy and really turn it into sort of firm policies from the Welsh Government and NRW's point of view, as well as local authorities and national parks as well. I think the, the question about policy levers is really important and hopefully uh, members of the group tonight will uh, share anything you know or insights and links on that and we can uh, pick up more of that. What are the Welsh Government doing? What are the policy levers um, and what needs to change? Um, Augusta, would you come in next? Hiya. Hi, can you Hi. hear me? Can yes, you great. Me? Yes, we can. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's my fur. Um, yeah, I was just going to mention quickly about Carmarthenshire Food Network. So Alex um, uh, touched on it because uh, we work closely with Alex in the steering group. Um, so, you know, um, we are working um, across Carmarthenshire to develop the network in various cluster groups. So we have community growers, um, we have um, chefs who are championing um, short supply chains, um, commercial producers, 
um, and we're working with um, wider community support organisations as well. Um, and we're trying to sort of uh, link people within and between the clusters. Um, we are working um, with uh, the local authority um, and um, how other a community nutrition team um, and we've just had a successful application to become a sustainable food place and we are working with social farms and gardens to trial um, a short pilot to um, explore um, a public procurement um, trial of local food so that is in you know in development phase let's say um, so watch this space we're hoping that we can um, demonstrate um, the positives from that um, and that will run till June uh, 23 so um, it's very much in the sort of planning phase at the moment um, just wanted to share thank you I, I'd love to put you on the spot a bit more about that what is this procurement project I think procurement is uh, something that comes up a lot on this and you know local food on the public plate so can you give us a bit more of an outline of what's happening in Carmarthenshire on this yes well a little bit um, it's very much in the early um, stages at the moment but we um, are um, We've identified a hub. I don't want to um, say where yet, but um, we are working with um, social farms and gardens closely through um, Boyd Sergar Food, which is a new emerging steering group, um, sort of more at the strategic level, and Carmarthenshire Food Network representing more the sort of grassroots operators uh, in the food system. Um, and um, we are will be kind of trying to that hub will be collating local produce from small scale producers um, with an emphasis on local organic but not wholly organic necessarily um, not necessarily certified um, but to champion agroecological approaches um, and then uh, the hub will be providing that um, to a cluster of um, public sector recipients or maybe one particular um, public sector recipient that bit of the um, equation is not yet worked out um, but it's a very short term uh, project uh, the funding was quite delayed in uh, um, coming through from Welsh Government um, so we're hoping that we can demonstrate something positive in terms of the cost effectiveness um, the nutritional value and um, the uh, benefits to the local economy and so on. So we're very excited and uh, we, we will definitely keep everybody updated as to uh, the outcomes. Yeah. Yeah, please do. That sounds really good. We're really, really keen to follow um, those kind of projects that get the major buyers on board, whether it's the health board or the schools um, and really good to hear you talk about the kind of nutritional benefits because I know that our next speaker now is really passionate about what she calls nutrition security more so than food poverty so Elizabeth can I invite you to come in next thanks Augusta yeah thanks very much Dawn um I think if I can wear two hats um so first of all I would like to um just flag up about Boyd Abtawi um, so Food Swansea. So this is, um, I'm a member of, um, this is uh, an initiative to get Swansea to become a sustainable food place network member. So very similar to what's happened in, in Carmarthen and Carmarthenshire with Augusta. So over the last 14 months, a small group of, um, I'd say, pas very passionate volunteers, including myself, Margot Dawn, um, Philip, Catherine, Aaron, Tennessee and Laura, have been, um, we've been steadily moving forward with this initiative. And um, recently we held um, a people's assembly. So that was Swansea Food Forum on the 30th of March and had over 70 people attend. So they came from all different um, parts of the food system to share their ideas for a better food system that works for people and nature for the city and county of Swansea. And this was explored under the six key issues of the sustainable food places. I should say that um, Dawn and Zoe and the team for the region run a very successful regional food systems conference for South West Wales in October. 
And one of the recommendations was that the four counties become sustainable food places, in, including Swansea. So that was great. Um, you know, that really bolstered Boyd Abertawi's, um, you know, sort of enthusiasm and motivation for keep going. So in terms of the food forum, um, we're going to use the ideas to develop a vision and food charter for Boyd Abertawi. And at the heart of what people want for Swansea is a local food system um, with healthy food that's accessible and affordable, ideally high quality food that's nutrient dense, um, providing support to small scale growers and farmers, um, ideally using agroecological and regenerative organic agriculture and um, promoting and celebrating this local high quality food that's good for the planet. We also want to be building community networks and educating children and adults around food and growing and influencing policy to help create a food system which contributes to climate change through food act activism. So all very exciting ideas coming out of this one event. So um, just to round up, a key challenge is that we are a, a very small group of volunteers. Um, we're trying to secure funding for a Boyd Apatawi coordinator. Um, this is the position that Augusta is, um, you know, it has for Carmarthenshire. And the coordinator is really crucial for the, our initiative to become sustainable. So we've recently submitted two funding bids. Uh, we've got no guarantee of success, but fingers crossed. And so a key ask is really about securing funding and getting help with funding applications. So if anybody is, um, you know, would like to help, please contact boydabatawi at gmail.com. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, Elizabeth. And I think that is perhaps a key point for discussion. I think a lot of um, local food initiatives tend to be really, really reliant on enthusiastic and willing volunteers and perhaps are constrained by that. And there's a broader issue about these Think you know these well-being economy initiatives we might call them uh, being so dependent on unpaid manpower and woman power and I wonder whether others think that's a, an issue and and any advice for Elizabeth and the Boyd Abertawi group on on funding streams and ideas for where we can look would be great. Um, right, another hand is up. Social farms and gardens. Let's uh, hear from you. Thank you. Hi Dawn, thank you. Um, my name's Alison and my colleague Nick is here as well so she might jump in at some point uh, which would be lovely. Um, it been lovely to hear from um, lots of other people. Um, so we're working with Augusta in Carmarthenshire. She did a great um, explanation of the um, project that we've just um, starting to kick off um, around procurement food hubs. So uh, just to kind of add to that also we're piloting one in um, another second food hub in North Powys which will be based at Cultivate in Newtown. Um, so just kind of looking at two, um, two spaces there that, and two organisations that will be trialling this in two different areas and seeing how that, how that comes off. So watch this space on that. Just to say, um, if anyone's in the kind of evaluation sector, we've got an evaluation tender out there at the moment. If you go on to um, www.farmgarden.org.uk, um, uh, the tender's up there. It's open for another week. Um, so if anyone's in that field and interested in evaluation of local food, that would be wonderful. Um, the other kind of piece of work that we're working on as well, um, and just to say as well, we're really excited that Elizabeth's um, part of the steering group of the procurement. So we're looking at measuring nutrient density of the food that's going in. Um, so that's that's fantastic. Um, the other project I just want to talk about is another um, rural development programme project that we're running at Social Farms and Gardens so until the end of June 2023 called Resilient Green Spaces. Um, we work, it's quite a large partnership, it's under the NRAW uh, funding stream um, and Holly who's about to speak next is one of the partners who's been working on it doing some research around community owned land, um, publicly owned land that could be potentially used by communities. Um, so we're particularly there looking at um, encouraging more allotments, encouraging new community orchards, um, establishing five uh, food hubs. So one is on in St David's, right out on the Pembrokeshire Peninsula. One in Ammonford. One in uh, the Rhondda and Treherbert of Welcome to Our Woods, and a couple up near Carnarvon um, at Shot Griffiths and Partner Ogwen. 
um so sorry I'm just kind of like bombarding you and hopefully some bits will stick and I've put my email in the chat so feel free to contact me about any things that are of interest um and also working with Lantra on future farming skills so a traineeship for um new entrant farmers which has been really exciting and kind of thinking about we're, we're meeting as a partnership next week for the first time which is very exciting all kind of 20, 20 staff getting together to actually see each other's faces in real life um, and hopefully that'll be a good opportunity where we can start to put some of these work streams together so thinking about the uh, research that Holly's been doing around um, land that could be available for new entrant farmers that's owned by uh, public authorities um, and thinking about the skills that are being developed for, by new entrant farmers in order to access that. Um, just kind of off the resilient green spaces thing, um, Nick might talk about this a little bit more actually, but we also run at Social Farms and Gardens the Community Land Advisory Service known as Class Cymru. So we've run that for about seven or eight years now. And we've just got funding for another three years, so which is great because it means we can really commit to supporting um, organisations as they make the transition, which doesn't always just take a year. So it's brilliant to have that bit more security on that funding there. Again, go onto our website to find out a little bit more. Um, but one of the things that we're always thinking about at Social Farms and Gardens is we support community growing in, whether it be a farm, a CSA, a, a garden, an orchard, an allotment. Um, is, is kind of the access to land and how do we find land for communities that are interested in growing. Um, and if we get offers of land, you never know, sometimes they come up, how do we match those to the right communities and how do we make sure it's the right land. Um, so this is an ongoing discussion that we're always having. We know that we have um, a good network of community growers and of communities interested in growing and we know that we have good resources supporting the, the things around like licenses and tenancies and, and the information that's needed there. Um, and Lucy, who runs CLAS, um, does a lot of talks with um, local authorities and councils to try and influence policy, but also to support kind of officers who are actually trying to get these things through. And there's, you know, there are some great officers out there who are really keen to see communities taking ownership of uh, management of, of local land. Um, so if anyone is interested in that, then please um, get in touch. I had a great conversation this morning. I'm just going to throw this last bit in there um, with some people from People and Places. So kind of arm's length from NRW government and still finding it so hard to find data of publicly owned land. So we were just chatting about how can we get there's so much information out there, but it's really hard to find. And then it's really hard to get permissions to access the data, let alone the land at the other side of it. So um, we were just exploring ways that we could start to share data on what data is available a bit better. Um, so that was really encouraging. And we are doing some mapping with Resilient Green Spaces, which will be open source um, and GIS compatible so that it can be shared and, and taken out and used by some of these policy makers um, to hopefully give a bit of a louder voice to communities um, across Wales. Um, so Nick, I don't know if you wanted to jump in on there or whether you've got more to say later. There's loads more of the stuff we do, but I could just pass on to Holly for now. That's great. And uh, I probably I may well invite you back in in a minute if you've got more to say on the on the sort of policy angle of it. Um, but Holly, would you like to pick up from where yeah, we've left sure. off? Yeah. Um, so I'm kind of here with two hats on this evening. Um, I'm the Wales Policy and the New Entrance Coordinator for the Land Workers Alliance. Um, Land Workers Alliance is a, a union of uh, generally smaller scale and agroecological farmers, growers, foresters and other land workers. And um, we campaign for a better food system and for our, for our members. Um, we've got over 200 members in Wales and um, we do, as well as our campaigning work, we also do things like um, farm, arrange farm tours and get togethers um, so that you know, members can help each other out um, and promote opportunities. Um, the work that I've been involved in with Alison on the Resilient Green Spaces, um, she mentioned a bit, but um, yeah, we're basically looking at um finding the opportunities for communities and new entrant farmers to access publicly owned land um so we've been speaking both to lo local authorities and also 
gathering information about people who are seeking land. Um, I'll put my email in the uh, in the chat. So if we haven't been in touch with you and you fit into either of those categories, um, then drop me an email. Um, it's yeah, as Alison said, one of the big challenges is actually just finding the people who know where the land is. So in even in a lot of local authorities, tracking down who knows how much land that authority owns has been quite difficult. Um, other things just to flag and Landworks Alliance work is, um, so I, I work on policy stuff um, and the Welsh Government has just an, announced a horticulture grant. Um, I, I'll put a link in the chat for that as well. That's a horticulture development grant. It closes in two weeks. So if any, if any growers out there are looking for grants to expand, um, get equipment, then definitely check that out. It will fund 40% and it include, unusually there's no minimum land size. So um, you don't, it doesn't matter if you don't have five hectares, you can still apply um, and you can still apply for secondhand equipment. There are quite a few hoops to jump through, but some of the fundamentals that they previ that previously held back smaller farms, they have removed, um, which is great. And yeah, lots of us in Wales have been campaigning for things like that. And they will be announcing a new a startup grant in at the end of May, around the 25th. So everyone look out for that as well. Um, and finally, the Senate is doing a, a Senate committee is in doing an inquiry into um, community assets and a, so what should change to help communities acquire more land. I put the link into that a bit earlier on in the chat. So if people are interested in that, scroll back. Um, the other hat I have is that uh, my husband and I are, um, we recently got nine acres of land and we are setting up a um, market garden um, it, between Newport and Cardiff and on the Gwent levels, which we're calling Blas Gwent. Um, and so we, well, I say we, he is doing most of the growing, um, uh, but uh, along with our, our trainee, but we'll be selling hopefully in uh, June, July, um, the first harvest. Um, I've already got in touch with quite a few people in Cardiff in terms of organisations, but um, not so much in Newport. So really good to see John on here. But if any, again, if anyone's around um, Newport Cardiff area interested in getting involved in the farm or uh, in any way, then let me know. Brilliant. Thanks for signposting to uh, those grants and for your insight in some of the stuff that Welsh Government is doing. Um, that's really, really helpful. Um, thanks, Holly. Um, and yeah, good luck with the new venture. That sounds exciting. Um, Sean, what would you like to say? Hi, Dawn. It's been a really interesting uh, session as I was expecting it would be um, so far. A um, couple of points really. Um, Holly, thank you very much for that information about the um, about the new grant. I understand that it needs those three years worth of accounts, which I think is is quite challenging for some people who maybe are only just starting out now. Can I come back on that? Sure. I, I watched a webinar on that on Tuesday. They said, actually, if you've got one year's accounts and you can explain it, they, then they might accept it. <laughs> um, the tricky situation is for people that have no accounts. Um, but so okay. do try. Don't be put off by everything that's in their rules. Send a question or apply anyway. Um, Thank you. I think that Margot and I will be quite busy tomorrow then. Um, <laughs> thank you for that. One of the things that interests me is what happens to the food once people have it. And I was wondering if people have had much experience in their organisations becoming involved in teaching people to cook and how they've gone ahead to try and mobilise volunteers to help people actually make the best of the food that they are given or they've bought. 
Thank you, Sean. There's a good question. Hopefully that will encourage a few more people to come in and tell us what they know on that front. Um, Robbie, can I invite you to come in next? Well, can I just respond directly there to the teaching people to cook question? Um, I've, I've, Robbie Davis and I, I represent a, um, a company called Wellfed, a social enterprise called Wellfed in, in Shotton, in the, the Shotton area. And Wellfed is a partnership between um, Flincher Council, Clwyd Allen Housing Association and Can Cook, which is, which is a, a, a social enterprise in itself. On the cookery question, we've taught about 16,500 people to cook. So um, we've, we've done that in every setting, whether it's homes, community centres, prisons, um, care homes, schools, you name it, we've, we've, we've done that. And, uh, and we've got a, a, a big story to tell, actually, and, 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 and I'm, I'm happy to, to share that with, with everybody uh, at, at the, the, the right time. Just, just quickly, because I've got a question for everybody, because this, this is a great audience, and, and some, somebody here has got the answer. Somebody here has got the answer. We, we two years ago, set out to create a, a, a real social a circular economy model. Um, and so we, uh, we cater for care homes and schools and nurseries. Um, and we are about to launch a, a region-wide um, updated, I'll call it reimagined re Meals on Wheels service. Um, like, the, like one of the earlier speakers, we also have a service called Well-Fed at Home, and this is a meal box service. It's, it's, it's not subscription, but it's a meal box service, and, and it's a meal box service that also carries a subsidy to enable people who are less well-off to buy in to, to the service as well. We're trying to get good food to everybody regardless of income. Um, and in the last, in the last uh, 18 months, we've given away 200,000 free meals to people who are in, in food poverty. Um, we have the capacity to, to, to produce 20,000 meals per week, fresh meals per week from the kitchens that we've got. And I tell you what our gap is. This is, this is our gap. Um, we've got mobile shops as well. They go to, into, into, into rural villages. I'll tell you what our gap is. I'm desperately trying to partner with farmers. We're desperately trying to partner with farmers um, who have surplus, surplus stock that we, we will pay for. We'll pay for it. We don't, we don't want it donated. You know, it's, it's just got to be good veg, that can be used to, to surplus veg, that can be reused to produce the, the thousands of meals that we can turn out. And we, we've got good farmland and sealing, but everybody's producing potatoes for Walker's crisps, you know, and it's, which, which is not ideal. So there's gonna be someone in the Northwest region that somebody on this call I know will, will know that is looking to, to, um, to work with us. So if anybody can help, Superb. And if anybody wants any more information, happy to share and tell you what we're doing and obviously share with everybody else. Thank well, you. Well, do, do keep talking, Robbie, because that just sounds like you've got some real scale there. And I'm sure um, partners and colleagues will be really interested to have your advice, insight, you know, what were the challenges and um, how have you managed to do that? How long has it taken you to grow to such a scale? Um, yeah, share more about what you're up to and how, how you've made it. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, would you like to do that now? I tell you, I tell you how we, I tell you how we've done it. Um, we, like I say, we're, we're commercial in, the, in the, we sell our services to, to housing associations, schools and, and nurseries, and, and we make a profit. This year, this year from, from that profit, we've, we've returned £100,000 directly into the service so we can subsidise meals. So that's, that's, you know, the whole structure of it is set up. We have a head charity. We have two trading companies set within, we're set within the body of companies that we've got. Um, we, we, we were awarded some money a couple of years ago from Welsh Government around the circular economy, and we've, we've used that to create some scale in the kitchens. Like I said, we've got big kitchens. F funny enough, we, we're about to outgrow those kitchens, which is, which is a frustration at the minute. Um, but what we, it, it's, it's always based on, it's, the whole model is predicated on we're commercial, and it's how we use that profit. 
and um, so far we've we've done obviously reasonably well because we're able to um, to return hundred thousand pound this year. It will be slightly more next year, interestingly, because we've just come to the end of our our financial year, and we are wholly focused on making sure that people on the lowest incomes are always fed fresh meals as a choice. That's really inspiring. Um, I think you said the name of your organisation is called Well Fed. Someone's asking in the chat. Yeah, well, sorry, I can, I can, I'll, 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 I'll jump onto the chat in a second and I'll start, I'll type in some details, yeah, about it. So I'll try, I'll try and kind of catch up what I've just said so people can catch up on all those things. Well, thanks, Robbie. Thank you very much for that. Um, Alex, we'll hear from you, Combrogi. Hi there. Yeah. So I'm with an organisation called Combroggy and we are looking to really transform the education sector because the education system is leaving a lot of teachers and students broken. And what we want to do is what we're offering, helping teachers navigate the new Welsh curriculum and signposting them towards everyone who's doing amazing things in the world of sustainability and circular systems uh, and we're inviting educators and learners to self-initiate an action impact project. So basically their own, their own systems change, their own, the change that they want to see. And we empower them through a program that isn't only focused on the science and circular systems thinking, but is championing creativity to get them to be playful and imaginative and open and stretch their imaginations and getting them to be collaborative and relate like learn how to relate in different ways and that comes down to themselves as well so being well and well-being and having that as an integral practice is also what we're advocating so teachers aren't well kids aren't well like start start with your own well-being and then like relate to the outside world in a different way We've got an online program. We've got an on-site program. So our headquarters are in Lorraine in uh, deep Pembrokeshire in a beautiful national uh, park, trust park overlooking the estuary. We've got a regenerative uh, farmland nearby and we've got a woodland as well. So we introduce them to those ecosystems. We host residentials and I'm also organizing a festival in September. Uh, and I would love um, to invite anyone who would like a stage and to talk to educators and learn is about the work that they're doing um, to, to come and be a part of that as well. That sounds really great, Alex. What's what's the festival called? Uh, the the last year was the Festival of Learning, but I'm trying to think of something that's a bit jazzier than that because um, that feels a bit old paradigm education system festival of learning. So uh, at the minute, Combroggy Festival 22. Let's go with that. Yeah, brilliant. So teachers are a key audience for this. We've talked in various meetings that we've run up for the region about the real uh, emphasis on engaging with kids in schools and teaching kids about where, where our food comes from. So it's great to hear about a project that's uh, training the trainer, um, equipping teachers with what they need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Thank you, Alex. Um, Elizabeth, thank you for your patience. Would you like to come in again? Yeah, thank you very much, Dawn, because um, I didn't say about my second hat, so I thought I'd come around again to say my second hat. So I'm um, co-founder and director of Growing Real Food for Nutrition, which is a community interest company, um, referred to it as Griffin, and it's about learning how to grow, measure and promote nutrient-dense food for better citizen and planetary health. So it's all about um, looking at the food system through a nutrition and, le and health lens to maximize health throughout the supply chain. So it's, um, you know, if you uh, think about the seed variety, now research is showing that traditional heritage heirloom, heirloom varieties of vegetables and fruit, they contain more antioxidants and polyphenol levels. So if we're wanting to improve people's health and population health, we need to select that type of um, veg. So, you know, um, traditional varieties of root veg and brassicas, they are the ones that have actually been shown to be able to reverse um, type two diabetics, um, health, you know, symptoms of type two diabetics in a randomized controlled trial in Denmark. 
So again, um, you know, purple carrots, for example, have higher levels of polyphenols than orange carrots. So why are we all growing orange carrots? We want to improve people's health. And a carrot is not a carrot. Carrots, um, nutrient content of carrots varies considerably. So there's a lot about how you grow your food is important. And research is showing that um, particularly regenerative organic and agroecological production systems, they produce crops with higher levels of antioxidants and polyphenol levels. Um, so, you know, it's just becoming aware of this. Um, I can see Valerie mentioned why her no dig garden produces better quality food. And I can, uh, you know, there's research showing that no till, no dig, again, it produces better quality nutrient dense food. It maintains, it, it improves the soil microbiome. And that's what um, farmers and growers need to be looking at. Again, we need to be looking at processing through this health and nutrition lens, um, how we're processing food, you know, to maximize the nutritional value of our food to then ensure that by the time it gets into people, by the time they eat it, you know, it's got more chance of actually um, improving, giving them health benefits. So there's a marvelous company in Swansea called, um, oh, it's gone from my mind now. Um, oh, something to do with ferments. I'll have to put it in the chat in a minute. Good for um, you, I think. Yeah, good for you, ferments. Good for, yeah, good for you, ferments. Brilliant stuff. I visited them at um, Summit Good CSA on Tuesday. Marvellous time. They, they've got a range of um, incredible sauerkrauts, absolutely delicious, you know, and they really do your gut microbiota. Um, you know, it's giving your gut microbiota a real treat. So um, as I say, we're also looking into ways, little tools of measuring how nutrient dense your crops are. This is a BRICS refractometer. And if you want to find out more about that, do get in contact. And there's um, uh, an app coming out um, from an American organization called Bionutrient Food Association, which will be a traffic light system. And essentially you could pick that carrot up in Tesco before you purchase it, put it up against your phone, the app on the phone, and it'll indicate through a traffic light system whether that carrot is low, medium or high in antioxidants, polyphenols and other nutrients. So then if you're sensible, you won't waste your money on buying a carrot that has little or zero nutritional value. So it's about empowering food systems. It can also empower growers you know, doing real time um, assessment of the quality and nutrient density of their vegetables actually in the field. So there's lots of exciting things happening. So I'll just put some information in the chat. And if you are interested in finding out more about what we're up to and about why we should all be shouting about food quality based on nutrient density, the fact that since 1941 to 1991, our um, mineral content of our food decreased by 40% because of industrial agriculture practices. So I think, you know, that as well as food being unsafe because of all the toxic chemicals and synthetic fertilizers sprayed on it numerous times, you know, we should all be getting very angry at why we are, um, you know, why um, really good high quality nutrient dense food isn't the norm. So thank you very much. Thanks, Elizabeth. It's really interesting. I did hear at one point or read somewhere, someone made an analogy with um, putting petrol in a car and if, if, if um, something about, you know, if, if a certain sort of petrol only ran your car, a litre of petrol ran your car for 10 miles, but a litre of a different kind of petrol ran your car for 50 miles and they were different you know you would understand the difference in price and that nutrition should be like that you know a carrot is not a carrot and a more expensive carrot might contain more nutrition and if we could get used to thinking about the nutrient density of food it might go some way towards helping us understand why we why we should pay more for food that's regeneratively produced um, or using these better farming systems. So it's a really, really useful lens to start to talk about the difference between um, properly grown food and industrial food systems. Thanks for sharing. Um, can I, can I well, just add Dawn that today we're invited to speak to um, a group of um, lead dietitians um, across all health boards in Wales. Um, 
because they were interested to know about, you know, the linkages between soil health, plant health, food health, sorry, animal health, food quality and human health um, in terms of then considering, you know, that local and um, quality food, nutrient dense food is important um, and impo very important criteria for food procurement for mm. our hospitals care homes. So that was really exciting to do that event today. So thank you. Mm, good work. Great. Thank you. Uh, Laurie, can we hear from you? Yeah. Uh, it's been really interesting. Um, I'm here on behalf of um, Eristeddfod Genedlaethol, um, National Eristeddfod of Wales, um, who are this year for the first time piloting a new food and wellbeing project, um, concentrating on five communities within Ceredigion, because this year the Eristeddfod has been held in Tregaron in August, the first week of August. Um, yeah, concentrating on five growing communities in Ceredigion, introducing elements of the art to it. Um, so primarily storytelling, we're seeing the importance of, um, yeah, personal stories, growing stories, dialect that's been lost, um, language, culture, um, and things like that. And also the possibility of um, songs, songwriting with the communities. And then we'll all have a chance to celebrate at the Estevod on the Wednesday night. Um, where everybody from the grown communities will literally bring something to the table um, and we can all grow and celebrate and eat, but also at the same time learning more about food waste and how to maximise, you know, the using local grown food. Um, yeah, and just, as I said, dressing in the art. So I just wanted to mention that just if anybody's got any experience in that or done something similar, it'd be great to hear from you. Um, yeah, the plan possibly is because the Stedford moves to a different county every year, would possibly be to grow the project and that it happens everywhere. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah, brilliant. I was in another conversation earlier today about the the connections between well-being and kind of culture and arts um, so that is a really interesting intersection thanks for bringing that to the table um, Nick let me hear from you hello um right well I, I'm just going to add a few more bits to what Alison was talking about um, so I'm joint wells manager with social farms and gardens uh, social farms and gardens we cover all of Wales and we're an organization that works to enable community growing on all different levels we've got lots and lots of projects going on and I'm we'll more than likely forget um, some but just to go into a bit of detail I've been posting some links in the the chat but so community land advisory service that Alison mentioned um, it's a Welsh government funded um, project we're very lucky to get Welsh government direct funding but um, we help communities to to access land um, and also identify land we, we help with right from um, the point of trying to identify who owns different lands through to negotiations we've got um, a whole raft of um, template lease and license agreements um, and and we will basically try our very best to support community groups um, right along the whole journey. But well, it's community groups and um, any any businesses, any social businesses that are looking to uh, to set up. So we support CSAs, um, care farms, um, and also communities wanting to manage green spaces. Um, so. Also, um, I'll just mention that um, if people aren't aware, Keep Wells Tidy are delivering a programme called Local Places for Nature, um, and they're giving out nearly 70 food growing gardens this year. And Social Farms and Gardens are one of the partners on that project, um, and we support the, the sort of design part of the um, of the project it's a um, fantastic package um they it's worth about sort of thirteen thousand pounds it's got raised beds greenhouse shed and and actually in some of our resilient green spaces work um that we're doing around allotments and um and orchards even though particularly with the allotments we're looking more at allotments for individuals the idea of sort of linking that up with a local places for nature package is a fantastic way of making sure that there's that opportunity for community growing as well so I just wanted to highlight that because we're very much involved 
Um, and then I just wanted to talk very quickly about one of our sort of little flagship projects um, in Cardiff called Edible Cardiff. It's a project in partnership with Food Cardiff and Grow Cardiff. Um, it's basically working and supporting a, a network of all of the different growers um, across Cardiff, community growers, um, and sharing skills and experiences, looking at potentially any sort of joint funding, supporting challenges um, and sharing opportunities as well. And um, part of that, we delivered a little sub project, um, just going back to, to what Duncan was saying earlier, um, which made me think of this, um, which was a Welsh Government food poverty project called uh, Plot to Pantry. And we were actually looking at how we could get more fresh produce into um, pantries. And obviously, community growing, people grow and in typically it's shared amongst the volunteers or it's cooked and, and sort of enjoyed at site. But um, we were looking at two, two prongs. Um, firstly, working with allotment sites. And there's a lot of people that grow food because they, they love what they do, but they don't necessarily have the families um, to share it with. So we were actually picking up um, allotment surplus to try and reduce that waste going on to compost heaps. Um, we gained funding for an electric vehicle, which is now being hosted with Grow Cardiff. And the concept is that um, we're starting to develop a network of allotment sites that are happy to um, have their produce picked up on a weekly basis and basically give us give um, whoever's coordinating the pickups a message to say that there's something there. And then that food would go directly into the pantries. Um, we're also offered um, a range of different grants, uh, small grants and um, plug plants as well to encourage community growing to, to grow that little bit more and think about delivering and um, sort of sharing some of that produce back. Um, I'll also just mention very quickly um, as an organisation, we do our very best to support community supported agriculture projects, both through the, the planning side of things. So this is another thing that CLAS does um, support with planning applications. Um, we are working very closely with Tuvi Cymru, who have got a fantastic knowledge hub on their website um, for all types of growing. Um, and we're offering some specific um, CSA training. Um, and I will also mention that we did a project in partnership with Food Sense Wales last year where we gave out um, grants to, um, uh, to horticultural establishments under five hectares to demonstrate that actually a couple of thousand pounds can make a huge, huge difference to those enterprises. And we've been, um, I'll, I'll share the link for the, the little case studies that we've got on our website, but that was all part of um, some policy work that we're doing to really raise awareness with Welsh Government of how desperately that money's needed. So busy with so many things. I've been <laughs> trying to take notes on everything you've said, but yes, please do share things in the chat, Nick. That uh, really sounds amazing. I don't know what a care farm is. Uh, do you want to tell me what that is? Oh, um, so it's, it's a, uh, well, I probably won't describe it very well, but it's, um, it's looking at ther sort of basically therapy using animals so it, it can be uh, we've got a fantastic care farm in Pembroke called Clinview um, and it, it's sort of so health and social care run alongside farming and growing and animals and horticulture so thank you that makes sense thanks for filling in the gaps in my knowledge yeah really useful thank you Nick that's been really helpful um Valerie did you want to uh come in and respond to something that you've heard um are you there uh, I'll let you unmute yourself if you can find the button Sorry, just at that precise moment, my battery decided to run out, so I had to get the electricity plugged in. Um, ever so quickly, uh, point about land. When Mary Claire started Incredible Edible, she just used bits of land that she saw wasn't being used. And um, that's and, and that's happened in other uh, um, in other incredible edibles, including the one in Carmarthenshire. So they're only little pockets, but they can be used um, and they don't seem to mind. Um, I really like this idea about keep Wales tidy and I really want to, and the gardening thing, but I absolutely cannot find these three dots. 
So if someone could copy the three dots and, and then send me it, the stuff, I put my email in there, I'd be very grateful. Um, Lowry, I want to send you a, a paper that I've written for UNESCO Mother Language Day, because it's absolutely ideal for what you were talking about, restories. So I need your email. And um, what Learn with Grandma, which is my project, is about is sharing skills and knowledge across the generations. That's the main issue. The storytelling idea, for example, we've told stories for hundreds of thousands of years, in fact, um, and the technological skills for uh, creating them in the old fashioned way, all the old people know. It's just been going on. It's, it's endemic. Um, what we needed was the link between the um, printed book and the digital book. And of course, that's where the young people come in because they have technical skills that me, I'm 80 and I'm never going to learn. Or <laughs> it just keeps moving away from me so fast I can't keep up with it. Um, but we, we, we have, we older people do have skills and they can be used. Um, and um, what happened, I won't go into it all because it's too long a story, but I've spoken in UNESCO about this three times. And I rather think from the fact that I started talking to the head of IT in the education department, that Mother Language Day is the result of that conversation and the presentations that I've given in, you, in, in UNESCO. And the whole idea is again bringing the generations together to tell the stories, which of course can be about anything you want to tell stories about, including your farms. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to bring lovely. it right back to land again. Yeah. Yeah. So please Thank do you. send me that link because I'm absolutely done without it, done for without it. I'm going to share the notes from today's discussion and the chat uh, by email to everyone who's here. Oh, well afterwards. done. So you'll <laughs> have you. those and hopefully you can find the bits that you need. Um, right, I'm keen to share my screen now. There's a little gap in raised hands. Um, and so I wanted just to share my screen to have a look at this map that we're keen for you guys to start adding things too so you can oh, see on here that quite a lot of people have started adding projects to this map so it's a google map and it's a shared map um, that enables you to add your markers to it um, and just a quick tutorial in how to do it you shouldn't need to log in or anything it should be as simple as clicking up here can you see this button here that says add marker if I click on that and then zoom in to wherever I want to add a marker, and let's say it's there, then I get to name the marker with the name of whatever project I'm adding. And I also get to give a bit of a description, um, a few words and maybe a link. And then I can say, save changes. So now that is added here. Once you've added a place to the map, you can then go in and edit it, uh, which incl includes the option to add an image. So you can uh, drag some sort of um, image into that window there and it will give Dawn, you- I absolutely love all this, but I can't, a, see the work writing because it's too small, and B, I'm hopeless at doing it. But I'm in Motherby, which is just south of Clandavery. So if you want to put a little marker for me, that would be lovely. All um, right. Well, I, I will try and do that in a minute. No worries. And, thank um, you. And, yeah. and, then, and then I'd love to see the, the map afterwards. I'll share it in the in the email that I send round, the link to the map. And we're hoping to continue to grow the map after today's meeting. And we'd really encourage um, you guys to share it with other projects and initiatives that you know. Um, some projects, of course, are not sort of geographic, but there are some good ones already appearing here. Look, 
got um, Carmarthenshire Food Network going in. Uh, that's our Food for the Region conference that we run. We've got Boyd Abatawe in here, um, Fair Share Cymru. So it will be interesting if we can continue to build up the map because um, I think we've got a few, quite a few over here in North Wales as well. So that's fab. I do um, have a logo, but I can't post that into the chat. Don't so, worry, we'll uh, liaise afterwards and I'll get your stuff on the map. So uh, let me come I'm back sorry, to you on that. that. That's all right. A, if I had a grandchild here, I'd be okay. <laughs> the intergenerational connections. Right, anyone else want to come in with any final thoughts? Was that helpful? I hope I, those instructions were useful. I will um, encourage you guys to share that link to the map with um, other growing projects and social enterprises and um, with your own networks and we'll see how we get on. Um, we've got time for a few more comments if there are any, but otherwise I think it's been, I hope you agree, I found it a really useful <laughs> meeting, lots of different shared perspectives. Margot. Margot, um, if I could go back to uh, several people who talked about finding the land and about policy, and repeat again that we should all look at the current inquiry that the Welsh Government have until the 24th of June on uh, community assets. Um, it's been discovered by the Institute of Welsh Affairs that Wales um, citizens have uh, almost no rights on first refusal or first offer on uh, land or property that is, should be considered a community asset. And although that clearly covers buildings, it appears to be covering land as well. And the, the kind of phrase that um, is used uh, by the IWA is that England has a community right to bid and Scotland has the community right of first refusal. And Wales is looking to consider that uh, as part of its um, inquiry into community assets. Um, I haven't got the link to put into the chat, but maybe we could send that out afterwards, because I can see that an awful lot of people here probably have very relevant material to put into that inquiry. Okay, so is that the inquiry into community assets, Margot? Yeah. And it's in the Local Government and Housing Committee. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, land, uh, access to land keeps coming up. It was interesting what Valerie said about, you know, incredible edibles just taking over land. Is that guerrilla gardening? I don't know. Nick, did you want to come in? Yes, I just wanted to add to what Margot was saying, just to say that um, at the WCBA have been looking at access to land and community empowerment um, and access to assets for a number of months now, there's a working group. Um, it started in a very large uh, meeting, similar to this, everybody that was interested and now has worked down to a working group. Um, so that's WCVA um, uh, coordinated by a person called Ben Lloyd. So um, in fact, there's a, another meeting for that tomorrow afternoon. Um, but just to make people aware that that's, we're trying to do lots of different prong attacks on Welsh government to, to make this people aware that it's, it's it's exactly the same with community housing. Um, it goes right across the, the board. People need, and social enterprises looking at buildings, we, we need to have that opportunity to, to bid um, and for uh, prices to be realistic as well of land and buildings and assets. Yeah, great. Well, that brings us full circle really to um, what Duncan was saying right at the top of the meeting. Um, housing, um, access to land, and um, how that's so connected with our ability to support new farms to start up and develop. Um, Duncan also shared that, you know, the, the demand for sustainably locally support, sourced food is outstripping supply. Um, and we've talked a lot in this forum and other forums about um, 
you know, the need to grow the sector at scale, you know, really brilliant activities happening in pockets. And tonight has been a real uh, overview and a flavour of the sorts of things that are happening. And then some amazing initiatives that seem to have really scaled up. But that's the key question, isn't it? How do we make all this happen quickly and at the scale that's required to really um, make a dent in the amount of food that we consume here in Wales so that much more of what we buy and cook and eat is sourced locally from uh, the amazing natural resources that are on our doorstep across Wales. Um, we've talked about the different challenges in urban areas compared to rural areas and the need to make connections between urban and rural and we've talked about the kind of intergenerational connections that need to be made as well. Um, I'm aware of a number of other projects that are really working hard to get into schools and, and work with schools. I think at the moment schools and health boards need to do more to make sure they're getting locally uh, sourced nutrient dense food onto the plates of patients and children um, in our communities and uh, really really interesting to hear about the work that's being done to trial a few things around food procurement. Alex from Supperbox was talking about the challenge of matching up kind of growers with buyers and the different scales and the variations in the demand. We're also at for the region trying to uh, see where the connections are between the hospitality sector um, and local uh, local food producers and it's not easy to to match the scale and the, and the demand to what um, people can grow and what they need and Castle Howell in Carmarthenshire apparently has said recently that it's been almost impossible if not impossible to source um, Gower early new potatoes um, because farmers aren't able to grow them because it's not economically viable because buyers don't want to spend the money um, and apparently the challenge is in uh, making it viable to harvest the produce so Gawa early is just not available this year so um, yeah lots of challenges that we're all still facing but some really really inspiring work happening some really inspiring initiatives that we've worked hard to capture this evening um, and I think this has been a really great uh, overview and a scattering of fantastic initiatives so thank you all so much for giving up your Thursday evening to come along to the Wellbeing Economy Wales forum um, a few words before we close about Wellbeing Economy Wales um, as I said at the beginning we're the national hub of the Wellbeing Economy Alliance which is a global alliance of um, organizations um, working to promote uh, a well-being economy what it means and um bye bye valerie i see you waving um what it means and make it uh more possible more accessible and we're moving into a new phase at well-being economy wales of starting to really crystallize our strategy for the coming years similar to some of the points raised this evening um as a completely volunteer-led organisation, our resources are pretty stretched, so we're looking to um, secure funding, take on project coordinators and really start making a, an even bigger impact. But I hope these forums that we run on a weekly, on a monthly basis are a useful connection point. Um, but if you'd like to be more involved with Wellbeing Economy Wales or if you see more opportunities for collaboration, please reach out to us. We hold a weekly organising meeting and we welcome people to come and connect with our committee in that way. Um, thank you all so much for being part of this event, um, bringing together food initiatives and projects from across Wales uh, to crowdsource wisdom and share inspiration. Do add your projects to the map. Look out for an email from me with the notes and the chat feed. And uh, I think that's it for now. I've been Dawn Lyle from Wellbeing Economy Wales. Thank you very much. Bye for now.